there, friends of tomorrow. Welcome to Orbit 12.15. My name's Jade, this is my lovely co-host Sarah, and today we're sitting down with Dr. Jared Espley of the NASA Goddard, NASA Goddard, and he is um, not only responsible for working on MAVEN, but has also done work on Juno, and is also a D&D dungeon master. We will delve into all of those things starting right now. Um, so, Jared, uh, just kind of diving right into it, um, I really wanted to start off talking about MAVEN um, because uh, we think it's a little bit of an underrated uh, Mars mission. So can you um, just kind of explain what you specifically do for MAVEN? Sure. No, I, I do appreciate the, the interest in, uh, in the Mars program and specifically, like you say, on MAVEN, which maybe doesn't quite get uh, quite as much uh, attention and glory as some of the rovers that are on the surface. Um, and in part, that's because we're in orbiter. So we're in orbit around Mars. Uh, and um, we've been in orbit for several years now, actually uh, coming up on five years. Um, and our primary science goal is to try and understand what happened to the Martian atmosphere over billions of years and how possibly the Martian atmosphere was blown away bit by bit by the solar wind. And so we can go into that in more detail as, as we continue talking, if you'd like. Mm -hmm. uh, always. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so, okay, so it's basically studying the Martian atmosphere. So um, what, basically why? Um, are we doing this because we can foresee this potentially happening to Earth? Or what's kind of the, um, not only the scientific payback with this, but also, I guess, how do we apply it back down to the science we're doing here on Earth? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are two great questions. Um, both, you know, what's the intrinsic science that we're trying to do at Mars and what are some of the broader implications of what we can do with, with that science or what we're learning. So let me try and answer the first part first, which is about the basic context of what we're doing uh, with Mars science. So um, what we know is that Mars used to be a very warm, wet, possibly habitable. I notice I didn't say habited, but mm -hmm. habitable. Could, there could have been life uh, because it was warm and wet place. And we know that by looking at the geological evidence. We, look, we can see on the surface that there are dry riverbeds, dry lakes. We can look at the, um, the mineral evidence. We can see the different types of minerals. So some of the results from the Mars rovers tell us about the different clays, about the different types of minerals that get laid down in a water environment on the surface. And so it, there had to not only have been uh, uh, sprinkles amount of water, but it actually had, it, that couldn't be it. It had to actually be copious amounts of water that were on the surface to lay down these riverbeds, dry lakes, and all these minerals. Um, but then obviously we look today and obviously Mars is a cold, dry, inhospitable environment today. That's, that's just obvious looking with our rovers and our orbital assets. And so that's the context in which MAVEN comes in is we have this mystery, this fundamental mystery where we had a warm, wet, uh, possibly habitable uh, environment in the ancient uh, Mars. And today we have this cold, dry environment. And so what MAVEN is designed to do is to investigate one of the primary hypotheses about how that could have come about, which is that we think that the atmosphere was, in fact, thicker and warmer, and therefore the surface was much warmer at Mars uh, billions of years ago. And then gradually over time, that atmosphere got eroded away by the interaction with the solar wind, which basically streams off of the sun all um, continuously. And for billions of years, bit by bit, the Martian atmosphere might have been stripped away. So that's the hypothesis that we've been investigating with Maven. I love it. And so let's cut to the spoilers. Is that correct? That's the <laughs> hypothesis you've been working on. <laughs> yeah, but right. is it real? So, is yeah, the so sun that's exactly, yes, I laid out the hypothesis. <laughs> is that correct? Great. Um, yes, it does appear to be true. So, okay, all right, we're done here. We can move on and talk about what it, no. No, uh, no, no, not at all. There's so we're many things deeper. That, uh, that we can, uh, so many complications to that story. Um, but the bottom line is that hypothesis does seem to be borne out by what we're seeing with MAVEN today. And so what I mean by that is, again, this is an orbiting spacecraft. And so we're in this very elliptical orbit. So we come in very close to the planet, and then we go relatively far out, several thousand kilometers far out. And what we have on board is we have a variety of science instruments, instruments that are designed to capture the particles, the atmospheric particles that are flying away from the planet or not. Um, and also instruments on board to measure the electrical and magnetic fields, which control which direction those particles would go. 
And so basically with this orbit that we have, and like I said, we've been there already for five years, we are effectively trying to create a net to capture all these particles. Obviously, which is one spacecraft in time. We can't actually capture all the particles that are flying away from the planet and start to try and extrapolate what's going on on the broader scale. We can't do that with just one spacecraft at one point in time. But gradually over time, over these many years that we're in orbit, that we are able to start building up this net that's helping us to understand um, how much, how many particles are flying away from the planet at any given time. And now that we've done that, we have, in fact, um, started to capture that there is, in fact, um, a, uh, a comparatively tiny amount of oxygen, a comparatively tiny amount of hydrogen that is flowing away from the planet today. It's about 10 to the 25th particles, which is a huge number, um, but that's literal individual atomic or molecular uh, molecules, particles. Um, and so when you add that all up, um, then that actually comes out to like half a gallon of water per second, which is not very much. Um, but you multiply that over billions of years, and it does look like, in fact, that it bears out this uh, hypothesis that I lay, uh, laid out at the beginning, that the Martian atmosphere has been blown away bit by bit. So that's what we think is our current understanding, is that, yes, there definitely could have been a significant amount of loss from the planet. But as soon as you peel back the layer and you start trying to answer even more uh, complicated questions, then you realize there's a lot more going on. There's a lot more um, confounding factors. And that goes to that question, that other question you asked at the beginning about how we can apply this information to our understanding of our own planet, our understanding of other planets in the solar system, and our understanding of um, uh, other uh, planets outside of our own solar system. Let me get my light to turn back off. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> It's a friendly uh, hello. I was, like, I was trying not to lose my train of thought as I was waving, but um, <laughs> apparently every five minutes I'll need to move uh, dramatically enough to keep the motion. And we're okay with that. Yeah. Absolutely. If you feel the yeah. need, just and, and dance We can Jane. even join yeah. in. Yeah. yeah. Spontaneous right. breakout yeah. dancing. So we have a running gag in our in our science team that, uh, uh, that, you, that you know, when somebody doesn't have a uh, uh, something that they're really ready to say then somebody to, to, could just jump up and do like an interpretive dance of, <laughs> of the particles from the, rain, from the planet so there's always a joke about well hey dave why don't you get up and do your interpretive dance again so i won't actually do the particle flying away interpretive dance for you guys right now uh, but i will occasionally why not keep the most here, yeah. please do so. We love interpretive yeah, uh, dance. Yeah, thank you. But, uh, <laughs> it's kind of I a cornerstone. Decline. Yeah, we'll, we'll join in. You can teach us the particle yeah. escaping interpretive dance. And every time right, the lights right. go out, it'll be a dance break. <laughs> Beautiful. Right. So um, bringing it to the chat room, there's actually yep. a, a few folks asking some really interesting questions about Mars's magnetosphere um, from James Johnson, Gregorius Sodormo, um, and a couple of others. Uh, I'll kind of combine the questions into one. Um, but they're essentially asking, is there any theory on how Mars lost its magnetic field or um, if it even had a magnetic field protecting it in the past? Yes. <laughs> okay, great. Let me answer, try and answer that question. Um, let me step back and give some context for everybody else. I won't directly answer the question immediately. I'll give the context. So um, in general, many planets throughout our solar system, and we presume throughout the universe, um, have planetary sized magnetic fields. And so that includes your own planet, Earth. And what we think is happening there is that if you start with any sort of tiny little seed magnetic field, and it doesn't really matter what the seed uh, magnetic field is, it could be something from solar wind flowing out way in space, carries a magnetic field with it. A tiny little seed magnetic field, if it flows past something that's electrically conducting, in other words, for example, iron, uh, uh, molten iron in the core of a planet, then it can produce, uh, uh, induce a magnetic field there, and that can enter into a feedback cycle that we call that a dynamo. And those dynamos create a planetary sized magnetic field to get this feedback loop of motion and electrically conducting material combined together. So we think that's what's happened at Earth. We've had this uh, strong planetary dynamo, planetary magnetic field. We know that's happening at um, Jupiter and at Saturn, um, at Uranus and Neptune. It's uh, happening at Mercury. But it doesn't seem to be happening today at Mars. When we fly by with previous spacecraft and MAVEN, uh, with our magnetometer, an instrument that can measure the magnetic field, we don't see any um, strong planetary-sized magnetic field. Instead, what we do see at Mars, we still have, we see some patches of the crust that still seem to be strongly magnetized, but they're very localized. 
And so we think that is not originating from the interior of the planet. It's not a planetary magnetic field, but there's parts of the crust that are magnetized. And so that what that does is that gives us um, a clue about what might have happened at Mars. And so the interpretation is that basically the uh, Martian uh, Mars as a planet would have had a planetary magnetic field originally. And then at some point, that planetary magnetic field ceased. And the most likely scenario is that Mars is just smaller and therefore literally had less heat in it. And so very simply, once the Martian core froze and was no longer molten iron like ours is, then there was no longer the motion, uh, nor um, and there wasn't the motion. It was still electric and conducting, but it wasn't moving around. It sort of couldn't create this feedback loop that the uh, dynamo needs. And so at that point, the dynamo would have ceased at Mars and the magnetic field that was there disappeared. And what was ever going on at that time, if there were rocks that could um, be magnetically susceptible, uh, have some iron grains in them or whatever, hematite grains in them, then they would have kept the magnetic field that they had at that time. We see that on Earth, you know, like individual rocks can pick up the, the magnetic field that, that's near them. Uh, but on average on Earth, it all canceled out especially in the background of the planetary magnetic field. Um, but on Mars, these individual rocks would have just kept their magnetic field. And then if nothing happened for the next billion years, that's what the magnetic field we would still see. So that's the interpretation is that Mars had a magnetic field, global planetary magnetic field, and then gradually over time that went away, presumably because of the lack of uh, sufficient heat. And then the crustal fields kept their um, configuration unless something happened to them like a, impact crater or volcanism. And so that's why on the surface, wherever we see uh, large volcanoes or large impacts, the magnetic field signature has disappeared. All right. Um, so we do have a question from our chat that's following up on the magnetic fields. Uh, so you've got a magnetometer okay. on MAVEN and mm -hmm. your project lead for the magnetometer there, yes? Yes. That's correct. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so. How do you use the magnetometer system? And uh, so, sorry, Rebel on our chat room is asking, how do you use mm -hmm. the magnetometer system and how can you make a map from that data? Yeah, it's a good question. Okay, so um, first of all, let me say magnetic fields are really mysterious, <laughs> <laughs> is what I would really study for a living in some sense. On the other, uh, what uh, as a fundamental uh, thing, they are, you know, uh, one of these uh, fundamental forces of nature. And, uh, and so um, the, what we do with them in space is uh, perhaps um, slightly more straightforward. There's two major categories of magnetic fields that you can measure in space. One's the ones that I've been describing already, where something, a magnetic field is, is uh, locked into or, or part of some uh, physical uh, part of the planet, either the core or the rocks or the crust or whatever. Um, so that's one category of, of measurements that you can make with a magnetometer in space. When you fly close to a planet, you measure how the magnetic field uh, looks as you fly close. And especially with an orbit, it's great because you can kind of see how it, it kind of changes as you go flying by. I try and do like a little diagram with my hands. <laughs> so you've got the, the pointing of the magnetic field in one direction. As, as your spacecraft flies by, you can imagine how the, basically the compass needle would change as you're flying by effectively. Um, and then the other category of, of magnetic fields that you can measure in space are magnetic fields that are produced by um, very energetic gas, what we call plasma. So the upper atmospheres of planets and the solar wind itself and, and space, interplanetary space and even interstellar space is filled with plasma. And that just means uh, particles that have gotten enough energy that they've become ionized. Um, and once they're ionized, then electromagnetic fields can be produced and or um, control the motion of those particles. And so we can measure the magnetic fields of the plasmas, of the ionospheres, of the magnetospheres, of uh, the upper parts of planets. And so that's another aspect of uh, magnetic field measurements that we make. Um, so let's see here. That was part of the person's question, Rebel's question. They asked, how how do we use the magnetometer? And then what was the second half uh, of the Rebel's build, question? How do you build maps from that data? Oh, yeah, great. So I kind of <laughs> already addressed that. Um, yeah. But it's basically as one, one orbit pass by itself is not going to build you a map. Mm -hmm. But once you get a dozens, hundreds, thousands of orbit passes, then you can uh, gradually be building up a map of where those crustal fields are. Because as you fly by every time, there's going to be 
a slightly different angle of the magnetic field as you fly by. And so over time, you can build those maps up. Awesome. So I have another question from the chat room, CFIT. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is actually going back to the little localized magnetic fields on a surface rock. Uh, so if those magnetic mm -hmm. fields are local, are any of those uh, local fields strong enough to affect habitability? So I know we've discovered some magnetic field that the fields on the surface of the moon that cause little pockets of protection from the sun. Yeah. Are any of these Martian yeah. pockets strong enough? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's a great question. Um, they undoubtedly change the trajectory of particles in the atmosphere. So energetic particles, um, uh, as they come in, will affect the amount of radiation that the surface uh, receives. I mean, there's several questions of, of habitability. So um, the most direct way is is, is uh, radiation. Um, so that that's the part that I'm answering. Um, yeah. And so... Yes, uh, the magnetic fields are certainly strong enough localized to affect the trajectories of the particle, the energetic particles, of which there are two categories. There's just solar energetic particles, which come from the sun, <laughs> hence the name. Uh, and then there's also the galactic cosmic rays. Rays is kind of a misnomer there. They're also really energetic particles, so we could go into the whole um, light is a, a both a wave and a particle. But anyway, galactic cosmic <laughs> rays and solar energetic particles, they come in and they're the radiation in space that you have to worry about. Um, the local uh, uh, crustal magnetic fields at Mars aren't going to do diddly for the galactic cosmic rays. They just come in with so much energy. They're produced by astrophysical phenomena, supernova. Here we go. Dance time. time. Woo! Uh, and um, <laughs> they come in from the supernovas and the, and the uh, um, uh, galactic... Uh, events and extragalactic events those things have so much energy they just go streaming in they don't care about any sort of magnetic fields they don't care about our own planet's magnetic field really the mm -hmm. only thing that really seems to uh, affect their uh, input into the solar system is the sun's magnetic field it has a very slight modulation on the amount of galactic cosmic rays so that's not helped by the crustal magnetic fields but the solar energetic particles are in fact um definitely um potentially affected by the magnetic fields. And, and they are definitely affected in the atmosphere. The question that um, some of us are very actively interested in, in looking at is whether or not the surface where you would potentially have rovers or um, like uh, astronauts someday would literally be slightly protected um, in one spot versus another uh, because of the crust of magnetic fields. And so the answer is we don't really know yet. <laughs> and that's okay. That's actually almost more exciting as an answer than yeah. having a definitive one. Right? Um, if it's yep. a yes, why yeah. aren't we there yet? Yeah. <laughs> all right. So um, yeah. thank you so much for basically uh, explaining all the amazing work you're doing for Maven. And um, while mm -hmm. staying on the topic of magnetism and all that exciting stuff in space, let's go ahead and transition into talking about your work on Juno. Because um, okay. speaking of magnetospheres, I've never heard of something more terrifying in our own solar system's backyard than, um, than, than that of Jupiter's magnetosphere. So can you uh, delve into a little bit of the work that you did on Juno? Yeah, I can. So, um, I mean, um, the work that I personally did on Juno fell into two categories. So um, earlier in my career, um, and let, me, let me step back. It takes a long time to get to planets sometimes, and particularly <laughs> it takes a long time to get to planets in the outer solar system. So a typical Mars um, trajectory takes about eight to 10 months. Obviously that could be different if you had some sort of Uber rocket, but, but most trajectories to Mars take about eight to 10 months. Um, most missions to the outer solar system, meaning places like Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune and Pluto and beyond, so like New Horizons, um, take years, many years. So uh, I started working on the Juno project way back in somewhere around um, 2008, something like that. And at that point, we were developing the instrument, and I was a relatively junior uh, member of the team. And so I was helping to calibrate the instrument, the magnetometer instrument. So that was one aspect of the work that I've done on Juno. And then many years later, it launched, and then many years later, it actually got to Jupiter. So it got to Jupiter in 2016. At that point, uh, I was pretty fully engaged with what I was doing on MAVA, but they also needed some help down at NASA headquarters to do something that's called being the program scientist. And I always struggle to explain exactly what a program scientist does. It doesn't mean that um, they're in charge of the mission. 
Um, there's a principal investigator typically who's in charge of the mission. And that's a scientist at some other institution or it could be at NASA. It doesn't really matter. But the principal investigator is in charge of the mission. And then NASA as an agency is obviously directing the principal investigator and all of his or her uh, co-investigators to, to implement the mission. And somebody at headquarters, NASA headquarters, has to be that interface to make sure that the, um, the principal investigator of the mission is doing what they said scientifically. And also somebody has to be in charge of making sure that they're spending the money they're supposed to. So there's somebody who's called the program executive who's in charge of the money and the engineering side. And there's somebody who's um, the program scientist. And that was me for several years. In fact, until just a couple of weeks ago um, when um, uh, I was able to pass the torch on to somebody else. Um, and so as program scientist, my job was to make sure that um, the mission was doing scientifically what it claimed to do, what it had promised to NASA headquarters it was going to do, to verify that the science measurements that, that were laid out and agreed upon are being met, uh, and also to make sure that um, any uh, any sort of communications from the project and any interest in science results are being interpreted for my colleagues at NASA headquarters, because not all of them are necessarily specialists in all the different aspects. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did as a program scientist. And then early on, I helped out with the magnetometer. So I got to see kind of both from both ends, literally like above the project, again, not in charge, but like from the highest perspective, seeing the whole thing. And then like down in the weeds, like helping uh, calibrate and build the, the instrument. And so those are things that, that I've done on you. Nice. And I think that offers such a unique perspective from you personally, because to have, like you said, like that grand vision oversight, as well as like getting into the nitty gritty of the, the mechanisms mm -hmm. behind all this. So um, as mentioned before, uh, Jupiter is pretty intense, mm -hmm. uh, pretty dramatic, you know, mm -hmm. definitely king of the planets, right. uh, rightly so. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> what is one of what are a few of kind of the most like profound things you learned during the during your time on the Juno mission? Yeah. So um, we know a moderate amount about what's going on on the surface of Jupiter. Uh, we actually made a lot of discoveries with Juno about the surface, but that was not Juno's primary purpose. Juno's primary purpose as a mission was to peer underneath the clouds of Jupiter and to try and get a sense of what's going on on the inside. Excuse me. And when, so what I mean by that is that, um, well, like we've already talked about with MAVEN, we have a magnetometer on board in Juno. And we have some other instruments as well, like the microwave radiometer and um, a, a gravity investigation um, that allow us to peer into the interior and get a sense of what's going on uh, from, uh, on the inside. And so we're trying to make a sense of how is Juno stacked up on the inside? Does it have a, a, a core? How big is the core? What's the core likely to be made out of? What's on top of the core? Is there material that's under super high pressure but is not rocky? Is there some sort of... Uh, a metallic layer that's on top of the core. Um, and then what's the deep atmosphere look like? Um, and so that was the intention. And uh, Juno's uh, doing a great job. Uh, like I described on, on the Maven, these are uh, kind of slow moving missions. And what I mean by that is it, it's not like you just make an immediate uh, discovery just based on one um, set of observations. You have to build up a map. So what Juno is trying to do is build up a 3D map, and we're about halfway through its mission, even though it's been there since 2016, so going on uh, three years now. Um, it's, uh, it's only halfway through its mission, and that's because it has a really large orbit that it's in. It's a 53-day orbit, so every 53 days it comes close enough to the planet to make the observations that are most useful for those um, interior measurements. So we're only halfway through, but what we know already is that the interior does not seem to have the very finite, very dense core that everybody assumed that a, a gas giant would have. So uh, most people listening will know that Jupiter, of course, is a gas giant, but that most of it is, is gas. It's not a solid body um, like the Earth is. But we th thought that maybe there was a rocky core on the inside, and it doesn't look like that. It looks like it's got some sort of diffuse core that's spread out, like the mass that's inside there is really kind of um, spread out. And that Frankly, to me, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. That's not really my area of, of science expertise, but that this is one of the major results that's come out of the mission, um, is that the core um, is spread out and that and, and, and diffuse. Um, another major thing is that the, the deep atmosphere um, is connected to the atmosphere that we can see. So everybody is familiar with the great red spot, the huge storm at Jupiter. It turns out that when we measured, uh, flew over the great red spot with, with the spacecraft, we measured with the microwave radiometer, we could see all the way deep down into um, 
the, the roots of the great red spot. And it looks like they're connected all the way down um, to, the, to the, basically the layer where the, um, um, where the magnetic field would take over the, the, the conducting electrical metallic layer. So that great storm is going all the way down. And furthermore, seems to have um, more heat down below than, than up above. So there's definitely heat um, driving something underneath the great storm, the great red spot. Um, and then um, just to take a breath, uh, I, you might have some more questions, but the third major category of interior science that we've learned um, from Juno is we learned a lot about the magnetic field. Again, uh, we already talked about uh, dynamos, planetary dynamos. So that all still applies to Jupiter. Jupiter clearly has a planetary dynamo, clearly has electrically uh, conductive material, clearly has it in motion, producing this tremendous magnetosphere, which basically just means where the magnetic field controls things. But when we got really close and we took a, a measurement of that magnetic field, it looks like it's actually coming from several spots. Mm -hmm. It's coming, as, as with Earth, from the poles, but there's also spots near the equator. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like maybe there's multiple dynamos going on. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's conducting material kind of deep down and then there's conducting material higher up, or maybe we just don't understand. Yeah. Um, and again... Um, there's a lot of that um, where we just don't understand. And like uh, I think you said, Sarah, that's a great thing. Uh, uh -huh. That's what you want in science. You want to be confused and have a cool mystery to work on. And so, so that's exactly where we're at with a lot of these things. Absolutely, yeah. Befuddled is, as I like to call it. Um, so, mm -hmm. sorry, and I just find this topic so fascinating, just magnetospheres in general. So, you mentioned that, um, you know, it, it, it's not just emanating from the poles, but, you know, from the equator as well. So, Oop, dance party. Oh, whoop, dance party. Whoop, whoop, Intermittent. Whoop, 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 whoop. Oh, oh you got to run for it this time. You're going to have to do a little better than that, Jared. Uh, the yeah, escaping really. photon. We, we know you have uh, better <laughs> dance moves than that. So, um, so, when you visualize Earth's magnetosphere, you know, like you said, like north and south poles, and then they kind of jut out like this, mm -hmm. like, like, almost like mm -hmm. butterfly wings, but because, nope. there we um, go. because as you said, Jupiter is gaseous and it's, you know, very different dynamics there. Does that have an impact on kind of like, I guess the chaoticness of its magnetic field? Um, does it make it a little bit less predictable and a little bit more tumultuous? That's a great question. I don't think we understand the dynamics of the interior well enough. That's literally what we're trying to understand yeah. um, to, really make that connection certainly the upper atmosphere is very stormy and is very tumultuous like you said mm -hmm. um and that like i said that's another really cool result that we weren't intending to really look for with juno again the intent of juno is to look underneath but we we found a lot of thunderstorms and a lot of um lightning that's occurring that you can just visually see on the mm -hmm. surface that we hadn't really had a good handle of before so that's a really cool result another really cool result from juno going to that to that point of the tumultuousness of the atmosphere is we never had any uh, good views of the poles of Jupiter before because most of our observations are from Earth. So you could you know point telescopes like the Hubble or something, but you can't. You obviously can't see above the planet um, from our own planet. But the way Juno's orbit is, we come in over the poles, and so um, that's allowed us to see the poles. And there's these really huge circumpolar cyclones, we call them. So they're just circling around the poles. And there's um, several of them. I always forget how many are on the south and how many are in the north. There's eight on one pole and five on, on the other pole. Um, and I'm sure one of the viewers can probably look that up and, and tell us <laughs> in the chat. I forget, but one, but there are these huge storms, and so why are there why are there five of them up there? What what why don't they merge together? Because here at Earth, you, uh, some of the people uh, viewers might have heard about the polar vortex here at Earth that's causing all kinds of crazy weather. It's the same idea. You get these these uh, uh, storms that create in the poles, but there's only one really here at Earth, and so why are there all these storms uh, up there? So nobody knows. Um, it's I, I think it's an open question for the atmospheric dynamicist. <laughs> Speaking of questions, uh, you've actually answered some of the things from our <laughs> chat, and uh, okay. like uh, Raju okay. Luther on YouTube was wondering uh, what other instruments are on Jupiter and what will they be doing. So thank you for jumping mm -hmm. ahead. <laughs> and we also I, there there are a few more that I haven't mentioned. There's several other uh, plasma and particle instruments on board um, that that are, that help as well. Uh, and probably the instrument I haven't mentioned, but I've implicitly applied, mm -hmm. is uh, the JunoCam instrument, which yes. is just a simple camera. It was, in fact, it was not originally intended as a full science instrument. Mm -hmm. um, but it, clearly, if you're going to go to Jupiter, you want a camera in it. And that's where a lot of the really public-facing results have come out. So people who have been paying attention to, to, to Juno have probably seen the images 
Um, well, that's just all from JunoCam. So that, that, that's been a spectacular success, I would say. And one more thing about JunoCam before we move off it. <laughs> Everybody should know that that data is freely available. Uh, and you can go and you can download it and you can manipulate it. So a lot of your, hopefully some of your viewers are, are part of that. Um, and that's been a really huge success, I would say. Is that people sometimes make these beautiful pieces of scientific art um, where it's science data, but it's, it's literally like an art that you'd hang in, in your room. Mm -hmm. And then some people make them like whimsical too. You know, they take the image and they'll, they'll make uh, like little cartoony things and make, and make it fun. So that's awesome because everybody can take the, the data and do what they want with it. And so I think that's really cool. Yeah. Those images that are coming off of JunoCam, they're one of the things that you, you might want to look for when you're searching for those images, you want to get the lower saturation images. The ori you want to make sure that you're looking at the original data or mm -hmm. at one of those uh, saturation boosted um, mm -hmm. uh, kind of artist concept, ar artist mm -hmm. enhanced yeah. images. Uh, just be sure yeah. what, which one you're looking at. The, the, the original data yeah. itself is amazing enough, mm -hmm. but a lot of the pictures that we see, the, the really boosted colors with the purples. Yeah, those pretty gorgeous. Those have been... Those have already been tweaked by uh, yeah. by people at home. Yeah. yeah. So we want to be careful about that. But the original data yeah. is just stunning. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. oh, so, which leads me to another question from our chat. Uh, so, okay. Uh, CFIT again. Uh, knowing what we know uh, now, know uh, what instrument change, if any, do you wish would have been included in the Juno mission, or for future missions, what would you include on a Jupiter mission? That's a good question. Um, I mean, Juno is a very focused mission. Juno is designed to investigate Jupiter. And Juno is designed to investigate not just Jupiter, but the interior of Jupiter. Uh, and it had to be that way because it's it's not a what we call a flagship mission. And so it's not a mission like um, Curiosity, Mars Curiosity, or something like that, where it was an agency-driven uh, mission. Um, Instead, it was a, a focused uh, principal investigator-led mission. So I'm not sure that I, I know off the top of my head exactly what else I would change about the, the focus of Juno, but um, a slightly different flavor of that question would be, what would I want in a Jupiter system mission? And the answer is something similar to what we're doing already as an agency, which is getting ready to send missions to the moons of Jupiter. Because Jupiter itself is a fantastic, interesting place um, but its moons are really awesome as well. Um, and of course, your viewers will know the four major moons of Jupiter, which are Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Um, and so there's a major effort underway at NASA right now to send a mission to Europa, possibly multiple missions, possibly uh, to Europa. And so that would be one thing that I'd be really excited about in the future for a Jupiter system mission is those Europe, uh, uh, European uh, uh, missions. <laughs> By the way, I've managed to get my autocorrect now to change to not, whenever I start to type European <laughs> or Europa, <laughs> I, it used to fix it to a European, exactly. but it doesn't do that anymore. So I've trained my autocorrect to respond to my planetary science oh, uh, uh, autocorrect. <laughs> Gotta love AI. Learning um, computers. <laughs> beautiful. So um, you kind of touched on to where you'd like to see the future trajectory of um, not only Jovian missions, but you know Jovian moon missions. As as you said, they're fascinating worlds unto themselves. So then, um, where 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 do you where would you like to see? I guess both the Maven and the Juno missions. How would you like to see those continue? And where do you see um, this ultimately headed? So going back to Maven, talking about Mars. So learning all of this information and all of this data about you know what happened to its atmosphere, what it was once like in its past. This is very important for looking towards the future. As you know, there's a lot of talk of going to Mars, potentially habitating it. Is that the word? Habitabilizing mm -hmm. it. You know, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, all of the cinnam <laughs> cinnamon, cinnamons. All of the all the cinnam cinnamons. Anyways. <laughs> Before I keep making a fool of myself, um, where where do you see the futures of these missions going, and what do you think? How does that tie back into, um, I guess, you know, human exploration of space and, and getting closer and closer to these bodies? Yeah, um, I think we're at a really uh, sincerely interesting time. Like it's always. Um, well, we're coming up on the 50th anniversary of the Apollo landings. And so that's really, um, you know, I think reflective for a lot of us. Um, I mean, I, th 
you know, uh, not judging, but I'm pretty sure all of us here are speaking. Uh, we don't remember the Apollo uh, landings, but I know many of our colleagues do. Uh, and it's, I think it's a time to reflect upon how far we've gone, but how much we still have uh, yet available to us. Uh, I think it's also exciting how much uh, interest there is in um, society in general. And also, you know, it's thinking of like SpaceX and Blue Origin and all the other new space tech uh, companies that are out there that are interested in, um, in getting to Mars and getting to the moon. Um, with this opportunities for all the upcoming lunar uh, commercial landers and the science opportunities there, there's a ton of opportunities there. Um, so I really honestly think that there, that we're on the cusp of being able to actually push back out into the solar system again, not just with the scientific robots that, that my career is based on and my career hopefully will continue to be based upon, but also with, with astronauts. I think there's a genuine opportunity here that we will in the near future, um, all these forces are synergistically working together to push us towards um, uh, a, a major next step in, in exploration of the solar system. So speaking of that next step, with Mars and what you know of Mars's magnetosphere and the atmosphere and, well, what you need to have humans live sustainably on the, on the surface, what do you think is the best option for actually having that long-term habitation? What would we need to do? Yeah, so uh, sometimes people ask, you know, whether or not we uh, would need to restart the planetary magnetic field, because as we talked about, we think Mars used to. Um, this is actually one of the important things that I think is coming out of Maven science. It's kind of esoteric at, at, at first um, appearance, but- oh, um, Dance party. It, 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 there we go. Uh, <laughs> then um, what we, uh, what we're trying to understand is how um, planetary magnetic fields impact the amount of atmospheric erosion that can occur. Because remember back to that basic uh, idea that I was describing uh, with what we're learning from MAVEN is that it seems like um, the solar wind is in fact coming into the upper Martian atmosphere and gradually blowing away bit by bit the Martian atmosphere. And so kind of the classic story that we've always told is that happens because Mars does not have a planetary magnetic field, and therefore the solar wind particles can directly access the upper Martian atmosphere and, 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 and um, uh, interact and, and blow the particles away. Um, well, it's, what we're finding with MAVEN is that it's actually way more complex than that. It's really, I mean, Mars is a great laboratory for this. And what I mean by that is wherever these strong crustal magnetic fields are, again, not planetary size, but just localized crustal magnetic fields, we can see differences in the amount of atmosphere being blown away. And furthermore, we know from our own planet that actually those solar wind particles do interact with the upper atmosphere of our own planet, and they create the aurora. And that, so that's uh, in large part where the aurora, the southern and northern lights come from. Um, and when that happens, it also seems to be driving away bit by bit some of the terrestrial atmosphere. And so, and we've always had our magnetic field, a global planetary magnetic field. So I think, I think there's a genuine paradigm, I won't call it a paradigm shift, but a paradigm uncertainty, whether or not this classic story that planetary magnetic fields protect a planet, prevent the solar wind from blowing away the atmosphere. I think that's uncertain right now. I think Maven's actually shook that up. So, which is a surprising thing, because we kind of expected when we went there that that would um, alter it. So what I'm trying to, to, to lead up to to answer your question about how we would get to habitability there is I certainly don't think it's true that we necessarily need a strong planetary magnetic field to, to send astronauts to Mars. In fact, I know that for sure. We don't need a planetary magnetic field for them to go there. They need to be protected from the radiation that's there, um, but uh, uh, we're not going to get a planetary magnetic field to do that anytime mm -hmm. in, within hundreds or thousands of years. That technology is beyond us. And we don't need it. We can protect our astronauts from, from radiation in, in other ways. Um, so... I think our MAVEN science is helping us to understand how planets work better, but I don't think it's directly um, helps or hurts the chances of putting astronauts there. Um, what we really need are the ability to prospect for resources um, if we're thinking of like long-term habitation and, and uh, sizable um, colonies or sizable settlements, let's use the word settlements. Um, because 
it's one thing to have a few astronauts there and to just go and carry your own resources with you. But like, if you actually want to have lots of people there, you got to make sure you have lots of water available to you. And we just don't know how much water there is. I mean, we know there's ice, but like, where is it? And, and like, you know, so we would have to definitely start to identify, um, um, settlement sized resources if we we're going to have a long-term presence there. Very cool. Um, so, Kind of wrapping all of this up and getting your why, which is something we really try to to, to do when we're speaking to you know uh, folks like you who are just so full of so much information and, and so much knowledge. Um, right. So, can we get your opinion on why is this all important? I mean, yeah, as you said, like we're maybe not shifting paradigms, but we're not taking them as you know absolute truth anymore. And, and the same thing with like you know even with. I know there's going to be a lot of textbooks that are going to have to redraw their diagrams of Jupiter because every diagram I've seen has indicated some sort of mm -hmm. rocky iron core. Um, so yeah. but why, in your again, in your opinion, why is this all important? Why do you personally, why did you dedicate your career to these uh, fields? <laughs> fields, get it? Like yeah. magnetic? Sorry, Boom. go on. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I didn't even get the pun at first. Um, <laughs> I think was. for me personally, when I started, uh, it was about exploration. Um, so uh, what I mean by is when I was a kid, I wanted to, um, have adventures and go exploring cool places. And clearly the adventures are happening in space, right? Cause you can go be a Jedi in space. That's <laughs> a pretty awesome adventure. And you can go be a, uh, Barzumian, uh, a prince and, and, you know, fight dastardly villains and rescue princesses in space. Okay. That's mm -hmm. awesome. That's a great adventure, but that's in space too. So let's go and have adventures in space. Um, so that, I mean, that's, um, definitely where it all started for me is wanting to have adventures and have, uh, exploration and as of course, as I got older, uh, I realized I probably wasn't going to be rescuing a lot of Martian princesses. Um, <laughs> wasn't necessarily going to become a Jedi. Uh, but I, I also fortunately found out that when in, in science, then what you can do is you can explore space. Um, and, but you also learn how the world works at the same time. And so it's a way of indirectly exploring as well. And so that seemed like a really powerful combination to me. Um, and so uh, it, that's how I ended up here is, is I wanted to explore space. Like if I'd had to be, uh, like if, if I'd had to become, uh, get my, uh, uh schooling in, um, um, in, I don't know, English or, or I mean, obviously I took English, but, uh, if I, I didn't, what I'm trying to say is I didn't become decide that I wanted to become a physicist and therefore I will explore space. It was the other way around. It was, I wanted to explore space and the tool with which we use to explore space is physics and math. So I was like, great, no problem. Physics and math, it's fun, it's interesting. I'll learn that stuff so that I can explore space. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I wanted to do. That's amazing. So you basically reverse engineered being a Jedi, essentially. <laughs> um. Well, something like that. I'm not <laughs> sure you know, my, uh, uh, my abilities with the Force were quite the same that I thought they would be when I was six. But uh, I think yeah. you underestimate yourself, young Padawan. Um, yeah. Maybe he yeah. just set yeah. himself the right mission as hey. Dungeon Master. There you go. There it is. <laughs> All right. Well, um, Dr. Jared, I, I'm just going to call you Jared. Jared, <laughs> thank you so much for uh, spending your Saturday afternoon with us. Um, certainly, I got a whole lot of out of this interview, and it seems mm -hmm. like the chat room is just going absolute crazy. Sorry we couldn't get to every single one of your questions, but <laughs> nonetheless, you were just a treasure trove of fascinating information and um, certainly inspiring on top of that. So again, thank you for joining us. Um, before we say our official goodbyes, of course, this is the portion of the show where we'd like to give a nice little heartfelt welcome, or <laughs> thank you, to um, our citizens. Um, these are the folks who make the show possible, like the Escape Velocity citizens here. Um, and what they do is they contribute a certain amount of money per month on patreon.com slash tmro. As we go through these slides, you'll notice the font gets smaller and the names get more plentiful, and that is because they there is a tier for everyone, even my name's up there somewhere. Yes, so thank you again for making the show possible. There it is, I love it. Uh, <laughs> great wall of names. Um, and again, if you're interested in contributing to the show, yes, you can contribute monetarily on patreon.com slash tmro, or uh, as I've said before, you can contribute emotionally or just, um, you know. Like things? Uh, like things, you could smash that like button, yeah. you could subscribe, subscribe to the me. channel, share us to all your friends and fam, have us on uh, at the dinner table when you're all sitting and, 
Anyways, um, what I'm trying to say is thank you. Um, continue <laughs> tuning in. We will see you next Saturday, and we hope you all have a lovely week. Goodbye. Thank you.